Reincarnation, often misunderstood, holds profound significance in our understanding of human existence. Beyond misconceptions, it's a natural law governing evolution, not just a religious doctrine. Dispelling myths, we find it aligns with Christian principles and offers insight into life's purpose. Understanding reincarnation leads to a more fulfilling life, urging us to seek growth and harmony with natural and divine laws. To those who say, I do not believe in the doctrine of rebirth or immortality, I would like to reply by saying, do you really know what the doctrine actually means? In 20 years of public lecturing and writing on subjects dealing with spiritual and cosmic principles, I have found thousands who were ready to express strongly their disbelief in certain doctrines, and yet had to admit that they neither understood them nor had ever attempted to investigate them. It is truly difficult for one to accept a doctrine that is not understood, and it is especially difficult to accept a doctrine or principle that has been popularly misrepresented. This tendency on the part of human nature is nothing new. For in the time of Jesus and for centuries preceding his introduction of new principles, the races of man rejected many doctrines which they did not properly comprehend. No one compliments himself by saying that he has discarded or rejected a statement, a principle, or a law that he neither understands nor gives sufficient consideration to comprehend. Such an attitude is one of intolerance, bigotry, or ignorance. One may appear to be with the majority or with the popular mind in smiling at new ideas or new principles. But after all, the smile may have to be changed tomorrow by the sudden discovery on the part of the populace that the rejected or ridiculed idea has been found true and acceptable. After all, what is there about the real doctrine of human rebirth that any strictly orthodox religious person or any rigidly scientific mind cannot accept? I will grant you that there are certain things about the popular notions of reincarnation that are absurd and so greatly misrepresented that the logically minded or thinking person feels that it is a presumption upon his intelligence even to consider the statements made. When, however, we find that three-fourths of the world's thinking and analyzing minds have accepted a certain principle or doctrine for many ages, and when we find that the best informed persons and the keenest intellects in the business, scientific, and religious world have given their approval and credence to such a doctrine or principle, then we should feel inclined to give a few minutes thought to the doctrine and discover whether there is in it the essence of truth or probability. This is only fair to ourselves and fair to the doctrine. We have learned through experience in the past century that the popular impression of a doctrine, principle, or idea may be very wrong. We have learned through many important examples that even the learned persons and the commentators in encyclopedias may be misinformed in regard to certain principles and thereby influence or prejudice our understanding. Certainly, we in the Western world have learned that popular criticism is not always a standard by which we may safely gauge our own convictions. All of this is particularly true regarding the subject of human rebirth. When we read in the question and answer columns of the largest newspapers in America that a clergyman who is nationally known and is devoting his time principally to the answering of religious questions states that his understanding of this doctrine is that man may be born again as a cat or a dog or some other animal lower in the scale than the human being. We keenly realize what an injustice is being done to a very beautiful and important law of nature through gross ignorance or willful misunderstanding. And, if such a learned man has no better understanding of the real principles of reincarnation than this, we should not be surprised that lesser lights or those millions who do not have access to sources of information should have other distorted ideas regarding reincarnation. Perhaps the most important point to be kept in mind by each investigator on this subject is that the doctrine or law of reincarnation is not a religious creed, a religious doctrine, or a religious law. 
It is a natural law and has to do with the evolution of nature and the carrying out of nature's principles aside from any connection these principles may have with the revelation of God and God's omnipotent intelligence. In other words, the laws pertaining to reincarnation are no more religious than are the laws pertaining to conception, the growth of the embryo, and the birth of the body. God's divine laws as natural laws are unquestionably operating in this marvelous process of the reproduction of the human race, but no one would classify the study of embryology as a religious doctrine or a religious creed. The facts pertaining to embryology are strictly within the domain of science. Likewise, no one would think of classifying the study of disease, the breaking down of the human body and its ultimate transition as a religious or theological study, even though divine principles are involved. Furthermore, a careful and truly conscientious study of the doctrine of reincarnation reveals that there is nothing in the true principles that may be considered contradictory to any of the religious principles found in any of the recognized or long-established religions. Reincarnation, in its truthful presentation, is not antagonistic toward the principles of sound theology. And I know that Christians will be astonished when I say that there is nothing in the truthful presentation of the doctrine of reincarnation that is contrary to or inconsistent with the fundamental Christian principles as revealed and taught by Jesus. A reading of the other chapters of this book will prove that this is so, and it is a notable fact in the Western world today that Christians find more joy in the true understanding of the doctrine of reincarnation than do persons of other denominations. The reason for this will become apparent as this book is read. Again I say, however, that some of the popular notions regarding reincarnation and some of the willfully misrepresented fancies connected therewith are not only inconsistent with the Christian theology and doctrine, but with all true religions. One of the most often repeated criticisms of the doctrine of reincarnation, generally expressed by those who have had only a casual understanding of it, is to the effect that it seems strange that God should require the soul of man to have many and varied experiences here on earth. Persons expressing this idea generally say that they cannot see why the soul of man could not continue to exist without requiring incarnation in a physical body on this earth plane. This argument is generally presented as a conclusive and final closing of the entire discussion. However, such an argument is fundamentally unsound. It is not based upon any rational premise. The fact of the matter is that the doctrine of reincarnation does not start with the assumption or the theory that man must be incarnated in a physical body and have earthly experiences. Reincarnation starts with the fact that man is incarnated in a physical body and is here having earthly experiences. Since these two wonderful facts are established by our actual existence here and are therefore removed from the field of speculation and are not mere assumptions used in the doctrine of reincarnation, we must begin with the fact that man is here and is living in a physical body and confine ourselves to answering the question of why. Since the dawn of civilization, when man began to think of his vicissitudes, trials and tribulations, and to seek for some reward for all that he suffered, he has asked the same question over and over, why are we here? Theology has its answer to this question, and the answer has become evolved and involved until it is no longer a brief definite statement, but a group of statements constituting a creed. And there are many creeds according to the various viewpoints and beliefs. Science, on the other hand, has its answer also. But the scientific answer does not cover all of the elements, all of the principles which concern man more deeply than do the problems of cosmology and biology. If one eliminates the religious elements of the question, 
Why Are We Here?, and confines the discussion to either the materialistic or the atheistic viewpoint, there is still a great need for more light and more information on the complex problems included in the question. It is not sufficient either to say that we are here because of some divine principle known only to God and incomprehensible to man. There is nothing in the whole history of civilization and in the cultural development of man to indicate that any of the laws of nature or any of the laws of God were ever intended to be concealed and kept from man's understanding. The very inner nature of man seems to be inspired with an unquenchable thirst for knowledge about himself and his relationship to the universe, and nothing short of the truth in these matters will suffice. Our encyclopedias and textbooks of knowledge are filled today with free and exhaustive explanations of laws and principles which were at one time or another proclaimed to be God's secret knowledge and beyond the comprehension of man's finite mind. Those very questions, which at one time were condemned by church and state as heretical and beyond the right or privilege of man to ask, are now freely asked and answered with precise knowledge by both church and state institutions. In fact, religious and educational foundations are active today in the promulgation of knowledge pertaining to those very things which were condemned by the church at one time as nobody's business and God's secret prerogatives. Since we are here and since the church through its theologies claims that we are here because God created us to live on this earth plane, we have a right to ask the why and the wherefore. And since science also claims that our existence here is in accordance with a definite law of evolution, which is a logical consequence of the divine creative principle. We have a right to ask science to investigate still further and tell us what purpose is served by our existence. This book then is an attempt to explain in non-technical language and without religious bias or prejudice, the reason for the incarnation of a divine soul in a physical body and the purpose or mission of that soul in a physical body on this earth plane. The explanation does not involve any propaganda for a new religion, a new creed, or a new form of worship. It does not attempt to soothe the weariness and struggles of life, nor blunt our minds to the obligations of life. That the doctrine of reincarnation does bring, in its understanding, a newer and different viewpoint of life resulting in more contentment and more harmonious cooperation with nature's laws is simply in the nature of the laws revealed. But that newer viewpoint and that contentment which comes with the understanding of the doctrine of reincarnation in no way lessens the seriousness of life or makes man immune to the sufferings and tribulations which he must endure. Finally, I may add, without seeming to be facetious, that whether one believes in or accepts the doctrine of reincarnation or rejects it, the truth of its principles will continue to manifest itself and the laws will continue to operate. We neither obliterate nor modify a law or principle by denying it or refusing to accept it. Therefore, it behooves everyone to become acquainted with the facts and at least to know something of the laws under which we are living and by which we are directed and controlled in our existence. We may continue to live without knowing these things, and we may find some degree of satisfaction in life without understanding any of the principles involved. The whole culture and advancement of man's civilization, however, has proved that man has become more happy, more contented, and more masterful through understanding every natural and divine law involved in his existence. The constant quest for more knowledge along these lines indicates the restlessness of man's nature because of his determination to gain greater success and joy in life through the knowledge that is necessary for him to possess. For this reason, the knowledge of the doctrine of reincarnation will constitute one of the most beneficial aids to his education.